I want to call your attention to the gospel lesson this morning quickly in the time that I have. First of all, let me preface it by saying I believe, like you as a congregation in specific, like other congregations, there is a distinct modern application Jesus is appearing to the disciples in this text just for you because you're entering the call process. I like to make a clear distinction between interpretation and application of Scripture. There generally is one interpretation, but there can be a broad range of applications based on that interpretation. An interpretation is timeless through the ages, through cultures, through circumstances and situations that never changes. However, applications can be different and they can change. And this is often why people get confused is they collapse interpretation and application as the same thing, which they are not. But in this one, a simple interpretation of this gospel passage is, the resurrected Jesus is alive today and restores hope, purpose, and destiny to those who've lost the same. That would be a simple interpretation. But now, let's think about possible applications real quickly. A common experience that we share with the disciples in this passage is the experience and circumstances we call loss. How many of you remember the old commercial, Allstate? You're in good hands with Allstate. Let me see the hands. What happens if you miss a payment? <laughs> How reliable is that? Is Jesus more reliable than that? Then why do we fear when the bottom drops out in life? Hello? And who of us has not been tempted or faced or gone down the road of feeling disappointment with God when some grand vision we had about something, some leader, some church, some situation, a loved one, our health goes awry, the bottom drops out, first level experience, we go into isolation, we shut ourselves in and off from the world and other people, we go into isolation, we lose hope, and we move to fear. Right? It's a human dilemma. And I'm not judging people when I say that I myself have done the very same thing, as many of you have. So what is Jesus wanting us to catch a hold of here? I think one thing he wants these disciples to know that no matter what your circumstances, your problems, your difficulties, your obstacles, your disappointments, peace be unto you. My wife and I often see this, and I've told you this before, her and I are active dream interpreters, and it's very common for Christians to get dreams from the enemy where he's trying to generate fear from something and make it look bigger and worse than it actually is. The dream is God's way of telling them, if you give in to this fear or you give it power, it will bring destruction or it will bring harm to you or it will undermine your spiritual life. In other words, the message of the dream is you don't have to empower something that doesn't have as big a bite as the enemy is trying to show you. Jesus wants us to move in peace and not in fear. In fact, he says it twice in this gospel passage. Peace be unto you. And the disciples are struggling to move on with life and vision and purpose because the very master who made all these grand promises they, that they misunderstood did not follow through and they had no sense of understanding that he would rise from the dead. So what's left? It's like Paul says, if the hope of the resurrection is not true, we are of all people most miserable. That is absolutely the truth. But the power of a resurrected Jesus turned loose restores hope, overpowers fear, leaves in its wake peace, gives us new sense of vision and purpose, the ability to move on and move ahead into new destiny and purpose. But sometimes it's easy for us to believe that God has abandoned us and left us behind. We long for the good old days or the way things used to be, thinking that's the only way God can act and move and work and give meaning to our life. Well, maybe God is trying to bring in chaos so that he can upset the old wineskin, make it supple or less brittle so he can pour in fresh new wine. Have you ever thought about that? 
Maybe on some occasions he brings in chaos so he can reorder it into something new and beautiful. But the problem with that is we do not like the discomfort of the ride to get there. But to that situation, Jesus says, peace be unto you. And let's talk about that peace just briefly and what that is. Jesus clearly said, the peace that I give you is not the peace as the world gives you. He's saying my peace is different. It's not the signing of national leaders on a peace treaty and expecting by a law that nations will keep the agreement with each other. That's different. It's not a temporary halt to a conflict only to see it arise again. His peace is different. His peace has substance to it. When I was growing up on the farm, we used to have the old half-silver dollars. How many of you remember those? Before they put nickel or copper in the center of them, pure silver. And then when they introduced the ones with copper in the center, see, we used to get a 50-cent piece of allowance every week when I was growing up. You know what inflation has done to that. It's different. But we had the old silver dollar, and we had the one with the copper in the center. And I remember we did a little comparison. We went out to the Quonset with a concrete floor, flipped them in the air. The silver one would land, and the one with copper would land, and they were different. The one with silver had a certain ring to it, unlike the other. It was obvious which one was the real. I'm here to tell you that his peace is different from the world. It is an experience of his peace. Even when your circumstances have not yet changed and you have not arrived at a clear understanding of what God is trying to do in the exact moment, we're too narrow in our focus and our vision. And the suggestion I would make as an application, let's keep the bigger picture in mind. We're always a work in progress as a person and as a congregation. God has a vision in mind, and it takes steps to get there. It can't all happen your way right away. Sometimes the things take time. That goes for an individual, it goes for a family, it goes for a congregation. So keep the bigger picture in mind. Number two, empower peace, not fear. Where are you going to get it? Not the television set, not the internet, not somewhere else. You go directly to the one who gives it. This is what Thomas did. Thomas was not asking an unreasonable thing. He had an obstacle to get over, and it was intellectual for him. He had trouble believing because he could not connect the dots between his experience, his lost hope, and what Jesus had said and what the others said. He didn't want a second-hand knowledge or experience of Jesus. He wanted his own. I think that's fair. So Jesus takes him up on it. Thomas? Put your fingers in the nails in the sides of my hand. Don't doubt, believe. Thomas didn't even have to do it. He said, my Lord and my God. What he needed was a literal experience of Jesus. It's a move of 18 inches from here to here, done by the Holy Spirit. It results in new empowerment, a new commission, a new destiny. The old of what they thought or expected is replaced by something new that hasn't happened yet, but it's here by assurance of the Spirit in the heart. Thus the disciples are able to move forward into the future with something awesome and brand new. It's a picture of what Jesus wants to do for every single believer and every single congregation. So I ask you, are you nervous? about the call process? Do you have fears about it? The kind of leader you'll get? Does it cause you to open up or to isolate and shut the doors where even Jesus can't get in? Here's what fear does, and it's nasty. Anything that is bigger than Jesus Christ is simply too big. If our fears crowd him out, it's time to go to him to the drawing board for a fresh supply with peace. And when Jesus comes somewhere, wherever he has been and been invited in, it's always better than the way he found it. This passage tells us we can trust him to come and do that for us. And that's what we always need to do at every stage in life, whether a family, a church leader, an individual, a band leader, a pastor, the person in the pew, or an entire congregation, we got to do a little check-in with God and find out how the barometer of peace is working. It eliminates a lot of anxiety in relationships and amongst people in areas we don't even need to go to. 
So again, keep the big picture in mind. Empower peace and not fear. Open up, don't close down. That's the message he tells the disciples, and I think it's relevant for our day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for God's word that the resurrected Jesus has been turned loose to empower us not in fear, but in hope and renewed sense of vision. We are thankful. Amen.